we move on to a very very important area of biomimetics that is bio inspired optical materials where are we if we don't use our vision the most important sense organ we know that the moment our eyes open up we have a colorful world in front of us and how many of the living beings are deprived of relishing this beautiful nature in front of us so to address that defect in uh, disease states which are targeting the optical uh, tissues there have been attempts to uh, replacing it with bio inspired optical materials not only for replacement it also helps in handling many other requirements which actually the ophthalmologists really want so having said that the field of bio material uh, inspired optical material involves bio material bio optics and biomechanics because it is a um, a continuing sequential uh, course of events which actually define the bio inspired optical materials so as we go on to read bio inspired optical materials we know that the sun is actually the major light source and the tissues especially our sense organs actually perceive the light source through very intricately uh, kept light receptors inside the eye so that perception the ability to perceive light and then to signal that light and then to perceive it back and to receive and to reflect all that is to be again uh, uh, reflected as a biomimetic material so that is what the bio inspired optical materials uh, try to do but once you uh, see this that we knew we understand that it has to be a very smaller structure of a micro dimensional structure which has to be having a very nice bio material quick enough to grasp the light energy absorb the light energy and then derive the signals and perceive the signals and then send it to higher centers or perceive and then reflect it back so which are the bio materials which are involved in bio photonic structures or bio inspired optical systems so if you see this particular list of bio materials over here they are all very very simple you can see them the chitin keratin cellulose guanine aragonite reflectin and collagen are all very very simple basic bio materials which are very much available so having known that we we have been told that these are the bio materials which are involved in optical or bio photonic structures but it just doesn't stop with a piece of collagen how do we convert that into a bio photonic system that is the challenge so do the it is not about the bio materials mainly it is about how that is being organized in a particular structure and that is how actually that makes the uh, difference by in bio photonic structures so the arrangement or the organization of that particular uh, bio materials into a very intricate complex structure can only do this bio photonic property or only which can present a bio photonic uh, property so it is a very challenging field but very prospective field in healthcare uh, device making especially and now the next one is our most important mechanically adaptive materials as the word says when there is a physical stimuli when there is a physical stimuli or a mechanical stimuli if the material is able to adapt ability to adapt will give you a upper edge or a better survival edge applies to anything so your ability to adapt makes you more survivable or more capable to survive in any kind of challenging environments the same applies to material science also so if there is a physical stimuli or a mechanical stimuli the uh, material which is actually taking up that physical and mechanical stimuli is able to adapt and change its shape and structure good enough to survive that kind of stimulus or an insult or any challenging atmosphere in that way it is going to really help in the process of uh, biomaterial science and in creation of biomedical uh, devices so this is especially of great use in creation creating supramolecular uh, switches 
and then it's also helpful in shape memory mechanisms and actuators. So, as we move on the most important part of uh, mechanically adaptive materials is actually derived from polymers, smart polymers which are very important and which forms the basis of your mechanically adaptive mechanisms. How are they used? They are mainly used for forming scaffolds for regenerating tissues using stem cells and they are also used as patches in surgery. So, as already said, so these are areas where there will be constant state of uh, biophysical flux or changes happening. So, in those areas if the material is able to adapt and survive with any kind of stimulus that is happening then the uh, outcomes would be as expected or as desired. And then we move on to a very interesting area. We know that we are actually made of a skeletal framework and that is why now I am able to sit erect. So, this human body is able to sit erect in this way because of a, a inner hard framework and that inner hard framework is called as bony skeleton. And if that skeleton or framework was not there, I would just be a, a mass of tissue or a ball of tissue together. So, this structural uh, definition would not be there if the bony skeleton is absent. So, bone is such a beautiful tissue which actually is revered in the field of healthcare industry because this is actually what uh, forms a very very important uh, substrate of the morphological structure. As mentioned there are other similar structures which are as good naturally derived hard uh, structures or to put across uh, to in simpler words living tissues which are as or good enough or very hard are your bone and then there is another uh, tissue which is in, in a hard enough which is secreted by the nature itself or living beings is your knacker. So, these two are very very important and these are exceptionally strong enough to withstand any kind of physical uh, stimuli. So, that makes it really helpful and in addition to your bone we have teeth and dactyle clubs of somatopod, shrimps and bamboo. These are all examples of extraordinarily tough uh, natural derived materials. So, this beautiful plot over here which actually goes into comparing the toughness and the modulus tells that bone and knacker forms the most toughest uh, structures as far as natural materials are concerned. We have other natural materials all uh, below them. So, they are very very tough and having high strength and high modulus. And this is one important thing which you have to understand why is bone tough. And we know that there is a huge requirement for bone graft or bone replacement materials because we know that the incidence of trauma and the incidence of bone related diseases are very high. There is a constant need for replacement materials. As we understand that there is a huge demand for bone replacement materials, we have to go and see what is bone really made of. As we understand the architecture of bone, we can try to mimic the same outside in vitro and then place the same inside in vivo. So, the most important thing which has to be understood as we go through the bony architecture is that it is actually made of an outer compact bone and then we have the inner trabecular bone. So, these are very very important. So, the inner trabecular bone is called a spongy bone which is actually uh, got lot of spaces in between compact does not have space and it is tightly sealed. And then we also have other structures like this. There are um, leaf like structures which are wrapped around wound around and then we have something called as Haversian system. So, this Haversian system is a tube like structure with perpendicular Volkmann canals and over the uh, system we have leaf like structures lamellas being wound up around. So, this is called as the lamellar bone. So, the compact bone would be lamellated like this. You can see the projection here. So, there, there, there is a central canal. The central canal or the Haversian canal has the blood vessels which are very important to uh, supply nutrition to the bone 
and then we have the lamellated bony structures. The center part has your cancellous bone. So, this cancellous bone has the bone marrow. So, it has to have lot of spaces and that is why it is spongy in nature. So, where was this uh, uh, similar to or which structure is similar to our bone, natural bone? It is very similar to the bamboo tissue. So, when we try to mimic this kind of hard structures, if we can derive exactly a uh, intricate structure like this, it would be stronger as stronger as bone. And not only that, the other points which has to be mimicked from bone for better uh, graft system is that because of these intricate architecture which was already said, there are other intrinsic and extrinsic toughening mechanisms which makes bone very resistant to fracture. We, we definitely undergo fracture with very high impact forces, but normal forces bone actually is resistant. So, how does that resistance happen? It is because of the intrinsic and extrinsic toughening mechanisms. So, that intrinsic toughening mechanisms happens with collagen, fibrillar sliding, inheritance resistance of the hydroxyapatite which is the most important inorganic ion and then we have the molecular uncoiling, micro cracking, sacrificial bonding which all occur at a submicron level. So, all these are actually uh, placed in very uh, beautifully sandwiched process and then we can see that there is micro cracking, there is fibrillar sliding, all these are possible by that hierarchical arrangement of organic and inorganic ions in a uh, perfectly uh, sandwiched manner. And additionally, we have extrinsic mechanisms like ligament bridging and crack deflection. As we uh, keep uh, reading ligament uh, def bridging and crack deflection, we should understand that the bones are actually attached to the muscular structures by the tough ligament uh, structures. And then we have to read about nacre because nacre is again a very inspiring uh, heart tissue which can be e which can be uh, tried to replicate for bone graft like structures. So, if the uh, basis of how the nacre forms is that we have to understand that it is actually a uh, organic matrix, composed organic matrix and then we have the inorganic calcium carbonate coupled structure. So, we have a protein and then we have the inorganic structure together coming to make the uh, most tough hardest structure here. And this in vivo and in vitro has been tested and has been found to be osteoinductive meaning that it can actually induce bone formation. So, what are we reading about? We are reading about nacre, but this nacre is good enough to induce bone formation in vivo and it is also found to be osteoconductive. So, it can actually conduct and create new bone formation. It can initiate new bone formation and it can actually conduct and create a newer uh, bone formation and additionally, it is biocompatible and biodegradable as well. So, all these important characteristics which are very, very classically the ideal requirements of a graft material is present in NACA and there are numerous studies trying to replicate this beautiful naturally available uh, tough material. And now we move on to a very important uh, part of uh, biomaterial science. How are we doing biomimetics in uh, dentistry? So, biomimetics in the field of dentistry is very, very important. So, we have been talking about general topics uh, till now. What we need to understand is restorative dentistry is a field where we need very tough material good enough to mimic the naturally tough teeth structure and good enough to replace. Unfortunately, till date, we do not have a material which can actually give us the exact uh, strength which the enamel, dentin and cementum can offer. We have very, very advanced materials, but still they cannot match the naturally available structures. But what happens is there is a very, very uh, strong need of all these materials because dental caries is a disease which is the most prevalent disease of mankind. 
and because this is more 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 common we we can see that that unique tooth structure which is very very hard the hardest part of the body is a, is getting broken down because of microbial acidic attack so as it gets damaged we need to restore it back to bring back the function the most important function for survival of mankind that is mastication because only when mastication is proper that the uh, survival is possible by aiding in proper food intake and digestion so we can see that this teeth which was badly broken down is being restored into its uh, earlier uh, morphology so a complete replacement was of what was there already is what restorative dentistry is all about so what we need here is to achieve remineralization the material has to be bioactive and the material has to be uh, proper replacement so the important goal here is conservative restoration of damaged teeth structure whatever is left out is so precious that has to be retained and whatever has been lost has to be replaced so that has to be done and can be done with biomaterials and this biomaterials still have a long way to go to match exactly what nature has offered to us in the form of enamel dentine and cementum so what do we do what are the biomimetic principles principally existing having reading about biomimetics here it is very important to know what are the biomimetic principles in restorative dentistry so the first and well known among this is glass inoma which has got very similar properties to dentine and has got adhesive property to tooth structure and it also has gives out fluoride release so this is very very crucial especially in case of deeper dental caries where we need a uh, antimicrobial agent not allowing the um, bacterial uh, addition happening again and bacterial colonization happening again so fluoride release is of great importance additionally those fluorides are the ones which would actually help in remineralization as well and then we know biodentine is a very very famous frequently used word which is containing calcium silica based cement and this is also been used as a dentine substitute and another approach of doing uh, biomimetic approaches in restorative uh, restoring your teeth back is by using very very thin layers of filling materials this is especially applied with a polymer composite so composites have uh, become the norm in restorative dentistry earlier it was amalgam and nowadays composites have completely changed the picture of endodontic restorative dentistry and where we apply composites in layers but a biomimetic approach what is being advocated is the thinner the layer the better the strength which actually is a biomimetic approach of going in very small hierarchical approaches or very small hierarchical uh, growths so this is very important additionally if you can actually keep a fiber mesh among that poly uh, poly uh, polymer composites that would again aid in uh, reducing the polymer shrinkage so what are we trying to do we are again getting inspired by nature where we are supporting a scaffold we are giving uh, strengthening the uh, substance by giving a scaffold there and we also have high strength adhesives with improved bond strength and adhesive adhes property all are inspired by nature and we are just trying to mimic and redo what the nature has done and replace what has been uh, lost so in this way this is again a very important schematic picture so we can see that what are the requirements of biomimetic dentistry we definitely do a lot of restorative work in form of cavities and uh, in the form of fillings and then there is full uh, replacement of the entire crowns and then there is endodontic uh, management of the root canal clearance so all that can be approached with a very very uh, biomimetic approach trying to be as close to nature and not trying to be on the other end of the spectra being very very artificial as we go close to the nature not disturbing its um, architecture and its micro environment the uh, results are going to be more fruitful and going to be more positive and the most important here 
is remineralization approaches. Remineralization approaches in dentin and enamel are very very important because the approaches which are being tried are very crucial to bring back anything which is lost or which is trying to strengthen what is being lost. So having said that the biomimetic approaches use a epitaxial type of deposition. So this is exactly in sync with what nature has already done. So biomimetic remineralization uses epitaxial deposition which means that there is a nucleating agent and over which the uh, inorganic ions gets uh, attached and then it grows on to become a larger harder tissue. So you need a nucleating agent or a seed agent that is actually the triggering agent and over which there will be remineralization. So when this particular statement is being told, when are we, when we are going to do it on an artificial basis, how are we going to supply these nucleating agents? So these nucleating agents are in nanoscale. So that we already know that nano has advanced so beautifully and we have to just create nano scale nucleating agents. So these nano scale nucleating agents will act as seed molecules to attract inorganic ions and then the heart tissue keeps growing. So in addition not only the seed agents we also need a protein assembly that is very crucial both in dentine and in enamel also. So if you, we can create a protein uh, a scaffold over which there is an epitaxial deposition also then the phenomenon of remineralization of dentine and enamel would really be uh, uh, very superior and excellent in characteristics. And to be more specific about enamel engineering strategies, enamel engineering strategies are more uh, sought after because enamel is always um, looked upon as the most desirable heart tissue which is uh, to be engineered always because more uh, enamel is more stronger than bone and it is most frequently uh, sought after a biomimetic material and there has been numerous ad attempts to exactly recreate enamel. Recreating enamel has been the dream of many research labs all over the globe and there are few approaches here. So the first one is a de novo enamel appetite synthesis. synthesis. So you just create the appetites and then from the start and then you can also see that there is a protein guided enamel crystal growth. This is actually comparatively uh, uh, gives a, giving us a better approach because we create a protein uh, scaffold or a framework over which the crystals are seeded and that gives a more uh, specified outcome. Additionally, we also try to create a surface remineralization approach and then we also have enamel origin that is the cell enamel cell that is ameloblast cell based tissue regenerative approaches but that kind of approach is very very challenging because ameloblasts are very very sensitive type of cells and additionally there is induction of tooth new tooth regeneration that is tooth engineering approaches which means that in vivo there will be uh, the teeth itself is grown and we have the enamel in that so again all these are uh, in the process of research and there is huge scope of research in this particular enamel engineering strategies. Next we move on to another interesting area that is musculoskeletal system. This musculoskeletal system is more uh, challenging than or equally challenging musculoskeletal system is equally challenging as your recreation of enamel because here we are actually seeing a a sandwich of a soft tissue and a hard tissue area. So when we have a combination of soft tissue and a hard tissue to be recreated, it becomes more challenging because it cannot be a single material. There has to be material, two materials of different characteristics coming together to replace the soft tissue and to replace the hard tissue. And please do remember that at the interface between the hard and the soft tissue, the uh, material should have intermediate characteristics. So it is very very challenging and not only that we know that musculoskeletal system the muscle has to contract and has to have electrical 
stimulus or signal conducting abilities also. Again, we look into a series of materials which have been used and tested for musculoskeletal regenerative strategies. But what we need to understand is though again these biomaterials listed out here look very simple. It is about the architectural design which you are able to achieve with the materials which are suggested here. As already mentioned, we have the tendon or the ligament which is actually the soft tissue which is the collagen type 1 fibroblast and then we have the intermediate region which actually forms the cartilage and then we have the very strong bone. So, there is a soft tissue, there is bone, intermediate you have a, a firmer structure. So, there is soft, firm and hard on uh, one side. So, when we bring, to bring all these three together, the uh, derived materials or the uh, materials which is required to replace such a structure is very very uh, challenging. So, that is why musculoskeletal uh, regeneration is still under lot of uh, research and there is lot of scope in musculoskeletal regeneration as such. And then we move on to a very interesting area again bioadhesives as the word in indicates and as the picture over here depicts there is an incision and the uh, surgeon actually is trying to place a glue like substance trying to seal the uh, incisions together. So, these adhesives are actually derived from naturally available uh, worm like structures specifically marine species. We have the sand castle worm and the barnacles. All of us would have seen such barnacles near the seashore. The uh, big rocks over the seashore has such uh, structures stuck onto it. Next time when you see them try try removing it, it would be so hard impregnated onto the hard rocky areas. So, that is the capacity of the bio adhesive which is nature made. So, when we are trying to recreate that particular beautiful nature uh, structure, we have to just try to um, replicate what was there in that particular structure. We have the barnacles and the sand castle uh, worms here. So, when that was studied, it was found that it was nothing but polyethylene carbonate which is the predominant compound which was uh, uh, involved in having that adhesive capacity. In addition to uh, polyethylene carbonate, later there were other modifications which have been attempted and by adding your polyacrylic acid and then by adding DOPA again. Additionally, there have been uh, studies which has attempted to uh, add on with zinc and then hyaluronic acid as well to make more uh, different combinations and newer formulations. By doing this, there is again a, a range of products which actually claim one better than the other. Again, all these are derived from these very small humble structures present all over us, all surrounding us and all that we need to is just observe nature and then reproduce them and recreate them. So, the critical factors having said lot about biomimetics, it will offer lot of promises as I had listed you a quite of uh, many quite many applications, but what we need to understand is the critical there are still critical factors in biomimetics. Nature is above us and we are just part of it. So, when we try to create that particular or we try to mimic that particular existence itself, there are certain challenges. So, when designing newer materials, the most important critical is the chemical composition, the microstructure and the architecture. Creating everything by uh, one by one alone is not enough. There has to be a micro environment and there has to be biophysical cues and so many things. So, putting together is not easy. So, that is why we are evolving with newer materials every day and we have, we have numerous research works being published very very frequently. But what we need to understand is putting all these three together are very critical, but we have come a long way and there have been really very very impressive materials inspired by nature. So, again there are other challenges like we do not have a, a proper design rules. For example, please do remember. Um, recreating cell based enamel remineralization. That itself is a very big challenge because ameloblasts may not grow into the direction which is actually expected and which is very easily happening in the tooth structure cannot happen in vitro that easily. So, all that 
there is a very uh, important lack of design process and biomaterial uh, formulations are not that um, uh, what to say well defined or they need lot of uh, standardization and most of them if we go to a very high end uh, or a very harder structures they may, they may be incompatible to the body and existing fabrication techniques have their own challenges as well. So, these are the critical factors which are limitations in biomimetics, but I am sure there is a lot uh, biomimetic approaches have to offer. So, having with all that in mind, all that we need to know about biomimetics is that nature is a treasure trove of information. So, we can be inspired by nature and we can keep on creating just a glimpse at nature, any part of it, any natural structure has huge tons of information just waiting for you to open up, observe and recreate and best wishes for recreating and becoming the creator yourself. Thank you.